Hi everybody, welcome to another lecture for um, Introduction to Public Speaking. Today I want to talk to you a little bit about the idea of organization and why organization is so important. So if you remember from specifically our fir that first lecture on the history of public speaking, we, re we encountered the Greek philosopher Aristotle. And Aristotle's ideas on um, rhetoric and public speaking are still used today. And one of the things that Aristotle talked about were the different kind of canons of rhetoric. If you remember, there were five specific canons. One of those canons happens to be the idea of organization. Um, and organization can be extremely important in different types of speeches. Um, so we've already talked a little bit about the importance of the basic kind of components of speaking, why public speaking is important. Um, hopefully you've talked about, you've listened to the stuff on audience analysis, um, you know, topic selection, those kinds of things. Now I want to focus on that idea of organization and why it's so important. So when we're talking about this, some different kind of things, why it's important in speech, how can you kind of create a similar or different kinds of way of organizing ideas? And then we'll talk a little bit about the idea of culture and how that influences the different notion of organization. More importantly, however, I want you to focus on the different kind of organizational patterns that you'll be using in the various different kinds of your speeches, because there are different types of patterns for organizing um, basic public speaking. So the reason why uh, organization and content uh, you know, are important is because certainly the ideas that you have, the different kinds of resources you put together, are, are certainly interesting and important. But if you can't organize them in a proper way, if you don't have a good way of kind of structuring things, the ability to convey those ideas is extremely difficult. So organization is considered to be the number two, two aspect of those canons of rhetoric. And so in many respects, you could say they have equal importance. Um, I would say in some respects, sometimes they're actually more important because that structure is really, really important. And that's one of the things that I wanted to emphasize in that lecture that you hopefully have already taken a look at, the basic components of a speech. I firmly believe that if you have those basics, the intro body conclusion and the different components that are embedded in each of those components, that you can actually take that formula and apply it to practically any speech situation um, that you have. But in doing so, you have to take that skeletal structure add detail to it and also have a specific organization that's appropriate for the particular speech occasion um, that's involved. Often if you can't understand an organizational pattern, um, then audiences can't figure out what you're doing. In fact, I often um, am you know, grading students, you say lower, if I can't figure out you know, where their organization is, that's why I have such an insistence on you being really explicit with thesis statements, previews, internal transitions and so forth to let your audience know where you are because I guarantee you if I don't know where you are your audience the people that are watching you or are potentially going to watch this if we ever put this out for a larger audience will know what's going on so of course staying on track processing information are important when we're talking about different kinds of communication patterns okay um, of course this is kind of uh, you know self-explanatory, a clear introduction, middle, and so forth, and end are important. Um, the idea of redundancy, repetition often reduces this idea of uncertainty and so forth. What we mean by repetition is we don't make repeat mean that you repeat everything, but when you do things like internal summaries, now that we've done this, let's do this, first, second, third, clear signposting, clear structure, clear ideas of where you are, it, 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 it adds something to your, to your um, presentation. Never forget that your audience can get lost fairly easily. That's why you'll find in my writing, my writing, for example, is fairly bland. I'm not a very good creative writer, but I'm pretty explicit in my creative writing, or in my writing. And people always know where I am. I'm really, really into structure and signposting because, the idea, because of that notion of reader and, and audience comprehension. Okay. Um, so when we're talking about you know the, the difference between speech making, audience listens to speech or speakers deliver a speech once, readers are able to, of course, and so forth. So that's why that clear structure is important. Speakers, it's important to use simple, sh shorter sentences, and the organization will allow you to really cement those ideas with your audience. Okay? 
Now, when we're talking about, this is the more important aspect of when we're talking about different organizational patterns, the difference between linear and configurable. Now, this goes back to our discussion of culture. Remember I said that I, one of the reasons I like this textbook is that it talks about culture and understanding that different cultures have different ways of speaking. They have different kinds of modes, different kind of organizational patterns. Um, in terms of low context cultures, really within the West, and what you're going to be using, this kind of linear pattern. We, re you know, we really like specific kind of, you know, start to end. Uh, and then, when, you know, for example, if you've ever watched a movie, and if they do these kind of these funky flashbacks or different kinds of storylines, do you ever find yourself getting lost in the narrative? Um, a lot of people will praise that kind of filmmaking. Um, I, I think it's sometimes it's important and interesting as well. But if you do too much of that, I get lost in the storyline. I can't figure out who is who and where is what and so forth. You know, I tend to be a very, very linear person. And you'll find that most people in low context cultures tend to be also very linear. Whereas configural, high context cultures, you'll find that those kinds of cycles and that idea of listening and understanding and context is extremely important. You'll often find that narrative and storytelling is important in high context cultures. So for example, if you take a look at um, work by the anthropologist Stanislaw Bra uh, uh, Bronowski, um, Stanislaw Bronowski actually went to a variety of different kind of islands. This was actually groundbreaking work that he did um, in the early 20th century. And he found that the people in those, in the, in the villages and so forth, the most important people were the people who were the keepers of the stories. These were these stories that were passed down by, from generation to generation. You know, think about the books, of, the early books of the Bible. The early books of the Bible weren't actually written down. They were actually passed down as oral stories. We don't have any written record of the early books of the Bible until about 3,000, 3,500 years ago. But certainly the, Bi the stories of the Bible, the idea of Adam and Eve, Moses, Noah, and so forth, exist long before 3,500 years ago. So how did those stories get passed down? Well, they, they must have been passed down in some way, shape, or form, and they were passed down primarily through an oral kind of culture and so forth. And a lot of times, these kind of high-context cultures, in order to understand those patterns, you have to be embedded and understand the different kind of cultural cues. And that narrative sometimes can go round and round. It can go in different kinds of ways. You don't have kind of a linear pattern um, that you might have in different kinds of, of say, low context or, or you know, uh, different societies that we would have in the U.S. Okay? Um, linear organization, main points are directly related to the thesis or topic, they're step by step and so forth. You can all think of kind of a linear pattern. Um, in high school, a lot of you were taught the, the five paragraph essay, intro, body, conclusion, the different five patterns. If you think about uh, the structure of a speech, in many respects, if you have a uh, three point speech, you have your introduction is one paragraph, your three main points is three more paragraphs, and your conclusion is, an, is another paragraph. In many respects, the structure is the same. And I fully admit that I'm a fan of linear structure. I mean, I'm, I'm obviously from the United States. I prefer that more than anything else because it is what I'm used to. And I think it lends itself uh, best to students. So when we're talking about these kind of different patterns, what I want to focus on more, more importantly are the different types of linear patterns. Okay. So when we're talking about those uh, patterns of communication, the first being chronological. Chronological is pretty easy to understand. So if you were going to, to do a speech topic and you, for example, were going to look at its history. So if I was going to talk about um, you know, the, the history of the Boston, or the, do the Boston Red Sox, I might actually do it by specific eras. First, I'm going to talk maybe about the early era when they were founded. Then maybe I'll do the Babe Ruth era. And then I'll maybe do something like from the 30s and 40s or something like that. I mean, you obviously can't cover everything like, like the Boston Red Sox or some sports team or some individual within probably a four to six minute speech. So you have to curtail it quite a bit. However, in those kinds of speeches, if I want to do something like the history of something or if I want to talk about that background, doing a chronological pattern where it's historical in nature, is something that you certainly want to focus on. So we've got the idea of certainly chronicle, emphasizes the idea of time. Okay? Then you've got the idea of spatial order. You emphasize space or different kind of points in time. Um, it's used primarily in informal speeches. An example of a spatial pattern would be something like if you're going to do the structure of like a hurricane. 
So if you're going to talk about, you know, if you talk, think about the structure of a hurricane, you move from, say, the outer, the outer wall of the hurricane where you have all the wind and so forth, and then as you kind of move forward, you have the eye of the hurricane. That kind of, where we're moving to a different kind of space. Think about something like feng shui. Feng shui with the idea of space, you know, how we organize different kinds of aspects in the room in order to make it cohesive and, and you know, make sure that, uh, you know, chi is harnessed in a proper way. That would certainly be something that you would use for a spatial order. Um, cause and effect um, is a type of, uh, uh, type of uh, organizational pattern primarily used in, in persuasion speeches. Although it says informative, but it's primarily used in persuasion speeches. So we think about something like if you're doing some kind of like, um, you know, persuasion speech. If you know the reason why we have a problem in the United States, say with the the opioid crisis in New England, which is a huge issue, um, we could certainly argue that one of the causes of that is the um, over prescription of medications like oxycodone, oxy you know oxycontin, different kind of narcotics. So for the inability of, student, of people to have access to things like Narcan or whatever, there are a number of different kind of causes that we could find, and those effects, you know, unfortunately have created an environment where um, heroin addiction and, and prescription drugs and so forth are one of the, the, the major health problems that we're dealing with in New England and th really throughout the country. Um, you know, because of that over-prescription of medication and the inability to access, you know, different kinds of uh, potential counter-effects to those items. Again, I'm, when, I'm doing, when I'm doing these examples, I know I'm very simplistic in nature, so I know there's a lot more stuff that goes into that, so please, that's not gospel truth, I'm just trying to give you an example to kind of illustrate what we're talking about. Problem solution, all of you will have to do a problem solution speech for your specific, one of your persuasion speeches. Uh, problem, we'll talk more about that when we get there, but problem solution speech is basically a two-point speech where you outline the problem of something and then you outline the solution. Well, again, we'll talk more specifically about what that looks like, but specifically, maybe when you're, you're, if you want to do um, your speech on, you know, and I've heard this many times, but drunk driving, right? And the problem of drunk driving, the effects that it causes, the people who die, uh, the, the problems it might cause your family, obviously the, the, the could cost you your job, and the various kinds of solutions that might come with that. Um, it's fairly easy to do. You describe a solution. Actually, when I have you do it, I actually want you to describe more than one solution. Again, we'll talk more specifically about that when we get there. But it basically contains uh, two points and a lot of sub-points um, embedded in there. And then the final thing, and this is probably the most common common um, pattern that you're going to use for your um, informative speeches, and that's a topical order. And you can certainly inter inter intermingle things, but usually when we're doing informative speeches, we're going to break it down by different topics. So for example, in previous videos, I used the example of beeswax. Now, if you want to do your informative speech on beeswax, you know, so be it. I frankly don't care what you do as long as, again, you don't do anything that would get you or me in trouble, um, you know, some kind of, a, you know, illegal drugs or weapons or whatever it might be. Um, I also would recommend against doing things like on biography speeches or large topics. Um, you know, try to narrow your topic down into a much more sufficient, manageable kind of idea. But when we're talking about beeswax, remember I said, well, first we'll take a look at what how beeswax is made, then we'll talk about its applications, you know, what it's what kind of products it's used, and then maybe what the future might hold for beeswax or whatever it might be. So those are different kinds of topics. Uh, that's how a good chunk of you will be doing your particular speech, but it really depends on what you're going to do. If you want to talk about Disney World, for example, uh, you might do the different theme parks embedded in Disney World. Or if you want to do specifically Epcot Center, maybe you want to actually talk about the evolution of Epcot Center. If you're going to talk about the evolution of Epcot Center, then of course using a, um, a chronological pattern would be more appropriate than using some kind of top order. But most of you will use some kind of topical order uh, in some way, shape, or form. Okay? Uh, just really quickly, configurable formats. Um, speakers don't preview many points. They, there's not as much structure. Um, and you're responsible for kind of understanding kind of the, the different kinds of patterns. That's why it's a, it's a high context culture. You have to understand the cues that, is, that are going on 
as you're kind of moving through. And if you don't, you can get lost, especially if you're, say, a Westerner and you're in it. And that actually happened to me when I was on my trip to South Africa. I was listening to someone give a presentation, and I couldn't follow what they were doing. You know, and this was actually a politician. And the reason why I couldn't follow them is because my Western sentiment led me to think about public speaking in a different kind of way. And then I have to adapt myself to that particular situation. That's why, again, understanding culture is important. Um, if that person was in the United States, of course, they should probably adapt themselves to the situation that they're in. If they're talking before Parliament or before the President or before Congress or whatever it might be, uh, but it's something certainly to um, think about. Okay. Um, so different kinds of configural organization matters. Again, this is not something that any of you have to worry about. Um, because I don't expect you to do this. In fact, I would encourage you not to. On um, this idea of deferred thesis, sometimes you actually talk about your main points and then at the end you reveal what your entire topic is. Um, to me, that's just that's a recipe for chaos, especially considering the, the context that you're doing your, your speech in. Um, the narrative, uh, you, where you different, have different kinds of webs and threads and you have kind of maybe different kinds. So if you think about a lot of times perhaps a movie is kind of often sometimes done with a web pattern. You have different look, kind of little um, different storylines, and then they connect to each other later on in the movie. That certainly would be something to understand of kind of a web pattern and a narrative pattern. And stories actually you can use actually in your speeches, like if you're going to use an opening anecdote for your introduction. Uh, but a story. A narrative pattern is much where you tell a story and at the end, kind of the, the idea, the, the moral of the story is revealed in order to get an understanding of what you're trying to convey. And, and so illustrations are used, indirection and implications. And so again, understanding, if you don't have an understanding of what the, the reason for those stories, it can be difficult to find those, follow those different kind of patterns. So we talked about the different kind of organizing, organizing ideas. Again, for you, focus on the five different organizational patterns. Most of you will be focusing on the idea of topical. Most of you will probably, and, and, or, and or chronological for your first speech. And then when we move into the different kinds of persuasion speeches, we'll, we'll be doing a specific problem solution speech. And then also we'll be doing questions of fact, value, policy speeches, which again, we'll talk a little bit. Uh, later on in the semester. All right. Hope you hopefully you enjoyed this lecture and I will talk to you soon. Bye.